Next, we have Dr. Uh, Steve Morawski. Uh, he's a professor at the Downtown Partnership, Peter Betzer Endowed Chair of Biological Oceanography at the University of South Florida, College of Marine Science, and he's the director of the Gomery Sea Image Consortium. Go ahead, Dr. Morawski. Well, thank you very much, and uh, um, I'm uh, pleased to be batting cleanup in terms of the consortia. My, my colleagues uh, previously uh, gave a great description of their their um, consortia and also the interactions between the consortia in Florida, and I think that's pretty important. Um, the Sea Image Consortium has been uh, uh, alive since 2011, and so we have a, a long history. Um, we have 17 partner institutions. It's a very large consortium, um, eight of which are local Florida um, institutions. Uh, they're down the center of, of this diagram. So you can see they include five public institutions and three private institutions. Um, they, it also includes a, a very large international contingent, which I'll explain in a little, little bit. Uh, you can see that we are a very large, not only in terms of spread and in institutions, but but people as well. Um, you know, we have a wide diversity of of different disciplines that are involved. Uh, it's sort of like a mini Gomery. Um, we have a very wide remit uh, in terms of our um, types of um, of issues that we uh, we're getting involved with. So, just in terms of this overview. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we did or what did we do, uh, what did we learn, uh, what remains to be done. Uh, I think uh, we all have to, to leave some breadcrumbs for the next uh, set of analyses and people that will be following in our footsteps. Unfortunately, even with a half a billion dollars, there remain significant questions in terms of oil spill science. And then lastly, I want to focus on what we uh, perceive our legacy and certainly Florida's legacy to be. So in terms of what did we do, um, there, there are a number of ways that one can approach uh, any kind of um, large-scale investigation in terms of uh, impacts and then making projections. And, and so our um, philosophy was basically to to kind of work uh, along all of the major uh, modes of operation. And so we did a tremendous amount of insight to surveying and monitoring. Uh, and as part of that, we did uh, comparative spatial analyses, both in the region where the oil spill was and then other regions in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this was augmented by laboratory-based experiments, and, and Martin gave a good um, recitation about the importance of uh, combining laboratory experiments with field-based things. Um, and we also fed numerical models. And this is really important because um, we can publish in all of these other domains, but um, until we um, can actually uh, populate models that have a good predictive capability, um, we're still studying an event that occurred as opposed to saying, all right, in the event of a new um, episode, how are we gonna predict what the impacts are gonna be? And so we did quite a bit of work uh, in, in various disciplines uh, in terms of uh, both fish and sediment work, plankton work. Um, uh, we also worked uh, um, in marine mammals where we had a very significant presence there. Um, uh, we also worked on benthos. Um, uh, we did some field-based experimentation, uh, both uh, Joel Koska's work at Georgia Tech and Wade Jeffrey's work at West Florida. And then in terms of the laboratory-based experiments, um, we set up three, three major um, capabilities. One was at um, the um, TUHH, um, the uh, Hamburg Institute of Technology in, in Germany, uh, and then at the University of Calgary. These are high pressure experimentation labs. And then also a uh, um, exposure facility at the Moat Marine Lab, and as, as well um, an exposure facility in, um, in the Netherlands. So as part of our um, uh, sort of recitation of what we've actually done. We mounted 13 major ship-based research expeditions to all the far points of the Gulf of Mexico. And, and you can see here, these are just the expeditions on, uh, in terms of the tracks of the Weatherbird 2, but we also used the research vessel Justo Sierra, which is a Mexican research vessel run by UNAM University in Mexico City, and then as well, a number of chartered fishing vessels. And so you can see that our, um, our reach was very far and well beyond the uh, deep water horizon footprint in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And this becomes very important when we're trying to do comparative analyses of what went on. 
Um, we also did a, a quite a bit of um, work on small boat um, research vessel uh, issues, particularly up in the uh, northern, north central Gulf of Mexico, um, looking at uh, impacts on artificial and natural uh, reefs. Um, we also did uh, some coastal sampling. I wanted to highlight this coastal sampling in the southern Gulf of Mexico. Um, this was an expedition that we called the Tunnel Trek after uh, West Tunnel. Uh, West Tunnel um, studied the impacts of the Ixtoc One oil spill back in 1979 and 1980 and occupied a number of coastal areas from the Campeche all the way around to um, Tamalpais, right? And so we actually were able to locate with Wes's help those exact locations to see if we could actually find the um, Ixtoc One oil. And this was 35 years after that particular spill. And as you can see, we were able to find it, we were able to fingerprint it and identify it as, as um, Ixtoc One oil. This is really important because it tells us a little bit about not only in this case that what's going to happen in coastal areas in the northern Gulf of Mexico to, due to deep water, but we also did uh, 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 deep water investigations off Ixtoc, and that also tells us things about what went on. Um, in terms of some of the um, work we did in the laboratory, this is the high pressure facility at, in, in Hamburg. And one of the unique aspects about this um, particular facility is that it was able to use live oil, which is basically methane saturated oil as opposed to dead oil. And most of the experimentation in terms of particle size distributions and, and other things have to use dead oil. And what we found was that there's a very different behavior when the, when the gas is outgassing from the oil droplet in terms of making small droplets than, uh, than with, with dead oil. It also, the facility also can be pressurized up to 550 bar. The uh, Deepwater Horizon was at 150 atmospheres, right? So 1,500 meters, and so so um, certainly we can do that and, and look at basically all all pressure conditions in the Gulf of Mexico, which has a maximum depth of around 3,400 meters. And also we were able to simulate these rapid pressure drops. Uh, Deepwater Horizon um, with the with the uh, the blowout preventer had a, a, a pressure drop of about 84 bars over a very short period of time over a very short reach of the of the blowout preventer. And we, this pressure drop actually um, uh, helped stimulate the creation of these small droplets. So it's a very comprehensive um, uh, test facility. In addition to the high pressure test facilities in Calgary and the University of West Australia. Um, so what did we learn? And this is the short version. Uh, uh, it certainly doesn't do justice to all different things. Um, number one, not all oil floats. Um, you know, prior to Deepwater Horizon, whoever was was looking for oil in the deep sea. And I'll talk about that in a little uh, while, but clearly um, as has been referenced before, um, there, a major uh, part of the Deepwater Horizon oil ended up on the bottom. Um, Number two, that deep oil plumes can and were created by the effervescence of the gas saturated oil droplets and not necessarily the, um, the addition of, uh, of uh, dispersants at the wellhead in subsurface uh, dispersant injection. And this is really important moving forward in terms of response efforts. Um, for fish, it's an oily gulf. And by that, I mean, we did, in all the fish that we looked at around the gulf, we always found evidence of hydrocarbons, but the deep water horizon pollution was clearly apparent, particularly as we studied it over time. And this gets to the value of spatial and temporal baselines. Um, uh, number four, it's happened before with Ixtoc one which was a, a, an oil spill of similar, um, uh, similar size. Um, uh, and it basically tells us that deep water horizon oil will be around for decades. And last, um, uh, one of the things that we've been able to conclude from some of our analyses is that most of the ad hoc oil spill response measures had serious negative side effects. And that includes things like the water diversions, sand berms, and, and arguably the SSDI as well. So just in terms of some of the operational uh, aspects of what we did, um, you know, if oil, uh, if oil floats, why are we looking for it at the sea bottom? These are some of the sediment coring operations that we conducted along with the fishing operations and cruises that we called the Mud and Blood series. Um, and so here are some the results of some of the sediment cores that we that we looked at. And you can see that on the left-hand side, um, this is a uh, deep water horizon core. 
this um, manganese oxide zone represents the accumulation of, uh, of sediment, uh, oil sediment on the bottom. Um, this is a similar core that we, we took from the Justo Sierra, uh, showing that the sediment was, uh, the oxide zone was buried under about four centimeters of sediment, which is the sediment accumulation rate over four, uh, 35 years. So we could clearly um, show that this, this event happened in the past. And so this um, demonstrates the axiom of geological science that the present is the key to the past, and the past is a window into the future. And I think that's one of the take home uh, things that we, we were able to determine. So in terms of the sediment uh, discoveries, um, clearly there was a surface expression of deep water that translated into what we were able to observe in the sediment cores. And the interesting thing is a lot of this um, oiled sediment is actually moving down slope. You know, this was uh, pitched on a very steep side of the canyon. And it also translated into things like uh, uh, enriched uh, uh, or dead uh, carbon-14. And so we can, we can do that in terms of its tracking of the, of the footprint. Um, and, and the mechanism, of course, that uh, uh, brought most of this oil, uh, this um, uh, uh, oil from Deepwater Horizon to the bottom was the oil marine snow mechanism. But also there was um, what we would call the toxic bathtub ring. And that is when the plumes themselves intersected with the slope bathymetry, you actually got a ring here. And so we can actually differentiate which part of the uh, oil on the bottom was from snow as opposed to the grounding of the of the um, of the of the plume against the bathymetry. Um, we are also able to um, reconstruct the past uh, uh, using um, uh, archival satellite imagery. We're able to create a satellite image comparable to the Deepwater Horizon satellite images for the Ixtox spill um, using the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, which actually uh, only flew the year before the um, the uh, the Ixtox spill in 1978. So that was a really important uh, aspect of uh, reconstructing a spill that was very significant but very understudied. Um, as as was pointed out before, um, if you account for the the part of the plumes that actually was under the sea surface, um, there was a substantial amount of oil that was very widespread. And this is a this is a, a modeling study uh, conducted by Claire Paris and her colleagues um, looking at, at the extent. And this, of course, is really important for the state of Florida. Um, even though we didn't have a lot of uh, black oil on the beaches, it's very obvious that, uh, that oil uh, did intersect with the West Florida Shelf and had impacts on, on various biota. And so one of the things that our, our consortia has done is to simulate and forecast hypothetical oil spills, including this one off the, the extreme west coast of, of, of Cuba. And because now we have these modeling tools, we can actually uh, forecast oil spills anywhere. And so, for example, we've done four or five different simulations of oil spills, including one right off the West Florida shelf. Um, Part of our uh, work uh, at sea has also been doing uh, fish-related studies along with the, um, the simultaneous sediment coring. So we've, we've sampled literally throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the, you can see that the fish catches have been centered uh, in the north central area. That's because we've, we've um, done time series up here, but we've also contrasted it with um, these fish studies elsewhere in the Gulf. Um, this allows us to do a, a wide variety of of uh, uh, different calculations about the uh, sustainability uh, uh, and the susceptibility of the various fish populations. And, and these are um, size spectra analyses by country. And you can see that the size spectrum is, is uh, sh much shallower in the Gulf of Mexico, implying higher species diversity and higher abundance at large sizes. And so that, that is, is, is really important from a fish population dynamics point of view. Um, we were also able to look at um, uh, pollution in the various species, and you can see a huge hotspot of uh, PAH contamination in the north central Gulf of Mexico, but also some pollution in other areas as well. Um, if you look at the graphic over on the right hand side, you can see who the dirty dozen are in terms of the most polluted species. And actually, it's really interesting because um, the two most polluted animals in terms of PAHs are yellowfin tuna and golden tilefish, two species which have very little to do with each other, but uh, imply that there are different mechanisms um, of oil pollution in these animals. Um, 
In terms of priorities for the future, I won't dwell on this other than to say that one of the um, things that we did was to try to consider from the point of view of, of, of different aspects of, of oil spills. And, th and that includes um, initial siting of oil facilities, prevention, oil spill preparedness, response, and injury assessment, what we considered to be the most important priorities. And I'll emphasize that ICOPAR, which is the uh, interagency uh, com coordinating committee for oil spill research, is currently updating their priorities. And I do think that the Gomery community needs to comment on that. So in terms of our legacy, um, I do think that um, part of our legacy, and this extends not only to CMH, but the rest of the group, um, we have better approaches to spill prevention. We, I think we know uh, where the most risky places are in terms of geohazards and other things. And, and we can be helpful in terms of, of um, the, the agencies trying to determine um, you know, strategies to prevent spills in the first place. Secondly, we have better models of spills uh, when they do happen. That is the four dimensional aspects of modeling. We have better tools to assess the damages to natural resources. Um, we, I think because of the nature of our working relationships between government, industry, and academia, we will have a more coordinated response to the next large oil spill in the Gulf. We do have a more informed citizenry, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, clear to say, um, a, a wide variety of people throughout the Gulf are much more sensitive to the notion of what's going on out there and also in terms of trying to prevent these spills. Um, we certainly have a more uh, closer relationship with our international partners, that is Mexico and Cuba. And then I think most importantly, we do have a well-trained cadre of students. Um, to emphasize, um, there are lots of uh, products that we all developed and in our case we have a, over 250 publications and counting, and including these two synthesis books that we produced, along with some of the other um, uh, folks on the call who are co-authors. Um, I wanted to emphasize this point about um, impacts on, on political decisions. Um, we know that um, our and other uh, partners in Florida had a really important impact on uh, the constitutional amendment that state of Florida adopted to um, basically permanently ban oil and gas drilling in coastal waters. And there was a 68% voter support in what is, everybody knows is a purple state. And part of the, um, the argument was the data that we all generated. And I would actually contend that this extends also to the, the uh, change in the executive order um, for uh, an, an additional 10 years of moratorium in the Western Gulf um, based on the information supplied um, both uh, in a bipartisan way to both Democrats and, and Republicans. We have a legacy of, of multimedia things like the podcasts that we did um, that were featured on uh, Living on Earth. Um, uh, uh, they're up, up and available and certainly people can read them. Uh, we also supported the local arts community. Um, we have uh, a nice art collection which was featured in our books and also on display at the libraries, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we, we were able to uh, interact with uh, student communities like this day we had with 23 graduate students uh, in Cuba. Um, these students have zero access to the deep sea and so that was very important. Um, I want to say that uh, it is our great pride to leave this legacy, um, a tremendous number of graduate students, um, uh, many of whom are working in this field now, and they will be the next cadre of responders. Um, as was emphasized by um, Rita when she talked about Dave, um, there are four of our co-PIs that unfortunately didn't see us to the end. Um, we certainly remember these people every day. They were incredibly impactful in terms of uh, our contributions and, and we'll always remember them for the tremendous contributions they made to CMH and especially to Gomery. Um, and then last, you know, bringing the scientific expertise together across the Gulf has been really our, um, our touchstone and, and it's been our pleasure and hopefully we can keep this going. So with that, I wanna thank you all. Uh, and certainly thank Omri for the opportunity to uh, spend their money wisely. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Morawski.